Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, my name is Soumya Shurnivas. I'm in practice at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, and I'll be discussing interpreting OCT retina today. There will be a, there were a lot of excellent questions, which I hope will be answered throughout the presentation. And there were some questions about um, fluorescein angiography, OCT glaucoma, um, and fundus autofluorescence which is out of the scope of today's talk, um, but let's begin with some of the objectives for today's presentation. So first, um, you'll be testing your knowledge. And second, we'll be overviewing the introduction to OCT technology. And the goal for today is to help novices and expert clinicians better understand OCT capabilities in clinical practice. And finally, we'll go over a disease or specific OCT finding macula or feature from A to Z, and this will be reviewed. And to take full advantage of the remarkable images revealed by SDOCT, we have to first learn to meaningfully in interpret the various lines, layers, contours, and shapes in normal eyes. And once the findings in normal eyes are appreciated, we can then transition to de uh, detecting variations in different retinal, choroidal, and vitreal abnormalities. And today we'll re we will review some features specific to common and rare ocular pathologies. So please choose which eye you think this is an OCT retina of. Is it the right eye, A? or B, left eye. So the second question here is, what do you think this is a diagnosis of? A, is it choroidal neovascular membrane? B, pigment epithelial detachment? C, diabetic macular edema? D, clinically significant macular edema? Or E, central serous chorea retinopathy? All right, great. And we'll go over the answers to these polling questions at the end. So first, I'd like to um, complete their talk. Thank you for your answers. What do you think the diagnosis is for this image? So is it A, a retinal detachment, B, vitreous hemorrhage and retinal traction, C, vitreomacular traction, or D, none of the above? Thank you for your answers. We'll go over this question at the end of the presentation. The next question here is, what is your diagnosis? Is it a normal OCT retina? Does it indicate B, plaquenil toxicity? Or C, acute middle maculopathy? Or D, none of the above? Thank you for your answers. Here's the next um, uh, diagnosis slide. So is it A, choroidal nevus, B, wet macular degeneration, C, pigment epithelial detachment, B, sclerochoroidal calcification, or E, drusen? So next we'll go into the introduction and history of optical coherence tomography. So optical coherence tomography for, was first introduced in 1991. And due to the th transparency of the eye, so the retina can be viewed through the pupil, OCT has become an invaluable ophthalmic diagnostic tool. Initially, there was time domain OCT, and then nowadays we use spectral or Fourier domain OCT. So here you can see the quality of time versus spectral domain OCT. So OCT images were initially acquired in a time domain fashion. So what that meant was time domain systems acquire approximately 400 A scans per second using six radial slices oriented at about 30 degrees apart. And so this meant that we had a potential of missing pathology between the slices. Spectral domain technology, on the other hand, scans approximately 20 to 40,000 scans per second. So the increased scan rate and the number diminishes the likelihood of motion artifact, enhances resolution, 
and decreases the chance of missing any lesions. So time domain OCTs are accurate to about 10 to 15 microns, and newer spectral domain machines may approach even three microns resolution. So whereas most time domain OCTs image six radial slices, spectral domain continuously image a six millimeter area. So again, this reduces chance of missing any ocular pathology. So here you can see a comparison between time and spectral domain OCTs. So on the left-hand side, you see a um, time domain OCT with the scan generated sequentially, one pixel at a time at 1.6 seconds. And then time domain OCTs have a moving reference mirror. It scans 400 scans per second. Resolution is 10 microns. And this is slower than your eye movement. On the other hand, um, for your domain OCT or spectral domain, Entire A scan is generated at once um, based on Fourier transformations of spectrometer analysis. And you can see a stationary reference mirror, and this scans about 26,000 scans per second with a resolution of three to five microns. And this is faster than your eye movement. So down below, you can see two images. The one on your left is our time domain OCT, and the one on your right is a Fourier domain, and you can see a much higher resolution um, with the spectral domain or Fourier domain OCT on your right. Here we see a pathology of our epiretinal membrane with this uh, soda hole on our um, time domain OCT on your left and spectral domain OCT on the bottom and a couple of other epiretinal membrane scans on the right. So you should think of OCT's technology as identifying changes in optical density, which are either depicted in either color or grayscale. So color on your left, grayscale on your right. When two adjacent structures demonstrate large differences in the refractive indices, more light is reflected upon their interface. By convention, large reflections are depicted by vivid colors, such as red, whereas less refractive structures are depicted in blue part of the spectrum. And zones without reflection are black or nearly so. So hence, when you see a normal patient in the vitreous, um, it'll appear dark or even black. So on your right hand um, side, you can see an epiretinal membrane here uh, with an intact sort of outer retinal layers and you can see this tiny um, reflective area up top which is your epiretinal membrane. Here you see a loss of foveal contour and on the slide down below um, there is an intact, almost intact foveal pit. So this epiretinal membrane is more parafoveal, so away from the um, fovea here. And this epiretinal membrane on your um, left shows a pseudo hole because not all of the layers here are affected. And we'll go over more of this um, in detail coming up in the presentation. And so um, time domain OCT, the advantage is intensity information is acquired in time domain with their 10 micron resolution. Their disadvantage is limited acquisition rate due to a moving reference mirror. Spectral um, OCT has um, several advantages. So it's higher sensitivity than your time domain OCT, and there's no moving reference mirror, which is required. There's a high scanning speed, and since axial resolution throughout their tissue by evaluating frequency spectrum of the interface between the reflected light and a stationary reference mirror. And this can scan up to five microns of resolution. And the increase in resolution can decrease motion artifacts. And furthermore, you get repeatability for tracking progression of different ocular pathologies. One disadvantage is a noticeable signal drop-off with depth. 
And I had an excellent question about different um, commercially available spectral domain OCT models. So I've included um, four of them here, Heidelberg, TopCon, OptiView, and Carl Zeiss. And this slide is a busy slide here, um, but it goes over um, what the uh, different commercial OCT scans show. So on your left is a printout of the Avanti RTView XR. And as you can see, um, it, there's horizontal cross line scans, which shows intact foveal pit and good scan alignment with, your, uh, with the right eye up top and left eye down below. On your right hand side, you see a Heidelberg um, OCT image with a macular thickness V scan of the right eye. And on your left hand is an overlying infrared from this image. And on the bottom, you see the left eye with horizontal lines, line scans. And you can see RPE disruption um, in both eyes and some drusen as well. So the next here is a picture of um, 3D OCT 2000. Um, and you can see the report that it shows you on your left. And on your right hand side here um, is a HD OCT 5000 with a macular um, cube of the left eye here with intact RPE and sector macular thickness thinning compared to the normative data. So what are some of the advantages of OCT? Firstly, it's non-invasive, it's non-contact, it's painless, fast, reliable, sensitive, and finally radiation-free. So when would we get an OCT of the retina? So we want to examine um, the retinal layers. If we want to monitor progression of ocular pathology, if we want to plan treatment, or if we want to plan monitor response to therapy. And what are some limitations of getting an OCT? So the first point here is a good lacrimal layer um, is needed. And number two, transparent media is needed. Number three, dilation may be necessary. And four, it is limited to the posterior pole. So um, in the presentation coming forward, we'll go over um, keratoconus and how that may affect the OCT scans. So this here um, is a, a spectral domain OCT of a normal right eye. And you can see the retinal layers along with the chorid here on the bottom of the slide and posterior hyloid, which I have a picture of coming up next. And notice the marked change in reflectivity between the vitreous here and the internal limiting membrane complex, which depicts the vitreoretinal retinal interface. And please notice how the outer and inner nuclear layers appear relatively dark due to the change in optical density because light traverses the tightly and uniformly packed nuclei. In contrast, the inner and outer plexiform layers show increased reflectivity here. So here's a picture of the um, posterior uh, hyaloid that you can see on the scan to your right. And here, this dark space is your retrohyloid space. On your left side, um, you can see a nice posterior vitreous detachment where the, where the vitreous has separated here. And the first question um, you had to answer was which eye was this OCT scan of? And this is an important point um, because if you were just shown a OCT macula slide, notice how the nerve fiber layer um, in the right eye is you know very thick and um, hyper uh, reflective here. So this is a scan on your left of your right eye. And in your on the uh, right hand of your slide, you can see an image of the left eye up here. 
And notice how the nerve fiber layer here um, is thick and hyperreflective here. So therefore, the image on your right is a scan of your left eye. And this OCT shows a retinal pigment epithelial defect here um, in both of your eyes. So again, the image on your left-hand side is a scan, OCT scan of the right eye. And the image on your right is an OCT scan of your, of a left eye. So I like this image here um, because you can appreciate how thick each layer is. So it is color coded um, with the internal limiting membrane here up top on your view and choroidal stroma here down below. And SC or scler um, spectral domain OCTs are presented as cross-section cross of the retina, which appears as a typical histological slice in textbooks. And so by convention, the inner retina is close to the center of the eye, the vitreous, and the outer retina is close to the choroid and sclera. Remember that the outer retina contains the RPE and photoreceptors, and the inner retina contains the retinal nerve fiber layer and ganglion cells. So the next important piece of information to go over um, is with regards to the photoreceptor integrity line. So the foveal pit here is an important landmark on any OCT scan. And you can notice um, here, there's a very thin hyperreflective um, band here. And this is called the photoreceptor integrity line. So if you notice that the photoreceptor integrity line is not present under the fovea, the visual acuity will be quite reduced. And with some clinical experience, you can actually estimate the visual acuity based on the appearance of the photoreceptor integrity line um, based upon the appearance of this line under the fovea. And I'll go over a couple of examples of this on the next slide. The photoreceptor um, integrity line is important because it's a biomarker of photoreceptor integrity, both rods and cones. And the term PIL, photoreceptor integrity line, does not limit the usefulness of the concept of a biomarker, regardless of the precise anatomical location which is subject to debate and change. So the bright photoreceptor integrity line here, the PIL, has dark inner segments of photoreceptors above it and dark outer segment below it. So there are two layers here are not imaged on this slide though. And you'll notice a subtle blip here um, of the PIL in this figure, directly under the foveal pit. And this is not a cyst, but indeed a normal finding. It likely occurs because the outer segments of the cones under the foveal pit are longer and more narrow than cones and rods in any other zone of the retina. And note that here, the PIL is a very bright band with the dark band above and below it. So the dark band on the inner side here, above it, is the inner segment, IS, of the photoreceptors, while the outer band below it is the outer segment, OS. So you may have heard the term um, IS-OS junction, and this essentially is referring to the PIL line. But recent anatomical evidence has demonstrated that this is imprecise. And the more recent term for this you may have heard of is IS, so inner segment ellipsoid. But clinicians may dislike this term because it fails to convey the importance of this line. And hence, you know, photoreceptor integrity line is preferred. So if you look at these two slides here, um, I want to highlight, you know, the fact that up here on your top left-hand side, the photoreceptor integrity line here is intact and present even though you see vitreomacular attraction um, here. So because the photoreceptor integrity line is normal, um, the visual acuity in this um, top left-hand 
um, I will be good. And here down on your bottom right hand side, you can see the separation of the entire neurosensory retina from the RPE temporal to the fovea in this patient's right eye. However, notice that the PIL line here is intact. And so the vision here is actually 2020 because the macula is still attached and the PIL is present here. So therefore, um, this is a macula on retinal detachment that requires immediate treatment to prevent vision loss. And one of the questions I had was, you know, um, whether we can see a retinal detachment here on the OCT, and here's a nice image um, of this here. And another um, uh, question I had was with regards to macular thickness. I'll go over briefly what um, this is. So according to the um, ETDRS map, so the macula is divided into nine sections with three concentric ring, rings measuring one meter, one millimeter, which is the innermost ring, three millimeters inner ring, and six millimeter diameter outer ring. And this is all centered on the phobia. The innermost one millimeter ring is in the phobia, while the three millimeter inner ring and six millimeter outer ring are further divided into four equal regions. So this identifies um, the layers of the retina and determines macular thickness by measuring the distance between the inner limiting membrane, ILM, and the inner boundary of the retinal pigment epithelium, or PE, in each of these nine regions. So the macular thickness measurements generated by the OCT systems in all the nine regions of the ETDRS map were documented from each subject and were averaged for the purpose of analysis. So the phobial thickness was defined as macular thickness within the innermost one millimeter ring. And the mean macular thickness was defined as average macular thickness from nine regions of the ATDRS map. And it was found to be between about um, 229 microns thick and the mean macular thickness was 262.8 um, micrometers. And so the macular thickness um, of the nine regions of the ETDRS map um, is presented. And it was the thinnest in the phobia, so the innermost one millimeter ring, and the thickest within the inner three um, millimeter ring, and it diminished peripherally. So the normative values for macular thickness in otherwise healthy eyes were measured to be about 227 microns foveally and 270 microns um, using commercially available spectralis OCT. And this was similar to the TopCon OCT as well. And so now we'll get into the um, A to Z of the cases, you know, findings and features on the OCT. And first with A, we'll start with age-related macular degeneration, um, which you can see a slide up here. And this is dry macular degeneration because you can see drusen, which appears undulations and elevations in the hyperreflective band of the RPE with less reflective material beneath them. Well, the, notice how the inner retinal layers remain generally intact here. And the drusen are located under or occasionally immediately above the retinal pigment epithelium. And please compare this slide here with age-related macular de degeneration, their dry form, um, to the wet form here. And on your left-hand side, you can see a subretinal hemorrhage here um, due to wet macular degeneration. And here on um, this yellow arrow, you can see that the blood here is collected between the RPE detachment and the neurosensory retina. And you noticed how in the previous slide, the drusen here are seen as um, undulations here compared to the wet macular degeneration, where you can see um, the blood again collected um, between the RPE detachment here and the neurosensory retina. So this here for me um, is a br uh, branch uh, retinal vein occlusion on your left. And down below is our central retinal vein occlusion. 
So with the branch retinal uh, vein occlusion here, you can see uh, cystoid macular edema with um, intraretinal fluid here, which is this um, open arrow here. And you can also see um, the subretinal fluid here, and which appears hyperreflective with a little shadow down beneath here. So some characteristic findings of a branch retinal um, vein occlusion on OCT are cystoid macular edema, intraretinal hyperreflectivity from hemorrhages, shadowing, as you can see here from um, edema, and occasionally subretinal fluid. And you can see here, um, observe that we talked about the photoreceptor integrity line here. And um, this is not, intact here. So as you can imagine, the vision here um, will be reduced. On your right hand, top right hand side, um, you can see that once the edema has resolved, there is a disruption or absence of the PIL line here, um, which is an indication of photoreceptor um, cell death or disarrangement, which results in poor visual outcome here. Down below here in the central retinal vein occlusion, um, you can see intraretinal um, edema here. And you can also see a loss of that PIL line here. So the vision will here again be greatly reduced. And so this is another example here of intraretinal edema from a branch retinal vein occlusion. Um, and here on your right, you can see that there is a disruption here um, and thinning of the inner retinal layers here. However, notice that the PIL line here is intact, so the visual acuity for this patient um, will not be affected as compared to the visual acuity um, after the resolution of edema for the previous um, patient you saw here. So again, the important point is the PIL line um, is an, a good marker of, of how the visual acuity will be. So here is another example of a choroidal neovascular membrane or wet macular degeneration. And you can see how this um, blood is collected between the RPE detachment here um, and the neurosensory retina. And you can also see um, subretinal fluid here on either side of um, this scan here. And so um, you've seen so far that intraretinal thickening um, can be associated with many different diseases. So we saw um, branch retinal vein occlusion, occlusion just now. And choroidal vascular uh, pathology can be different from retinal uh, vascular pathology. So how do we differentiate? So what we do is look at accompanying features and way they group as ways to differentiate pathology. So here on this top slide, you can see um, intraretinal fluid with a large um, pigment epithelial detachment and hyperreflective material. So um, this here would be a, a slide of uh, CNBM. But down below, um, you can see again, intraretinal fluid with speckling here. You can see reduced reflectivity and notice that there's no pigment epithelial detachment here. And therefore, with age, a good history, medications, medical conditions, um, the scan down below is a scan of diabetic macular edema. And the scan up above here is a scan of choroidal neovascular membrane. So this slide here shows um, hard exudates here. So these are... Um, showing scattered hyperreflectivity, and they're located in the outer plexiform layer. So these are consistent with um, hard exudates. And you can also notice um, some subretinal fluid here on this scan as well. And recall that exudates are located in the middle of the retina, specifically in or adjacent to the outer plexiform layer. And drusen, on the other hand, are located either um, under or occasionally immediately above the retinal pigment epithelium. And so here um, is another scan of the fluid that you may see on OCT macula. So notice that you know, there's subretinal fluid here 
intraretinal fluid um, to the right of uh, your screen. And then you can also see that pigment epithelium detachment here. So we talked about dry and wet AMD, um, and here's a slide of geographic atrophy. Um, so you can see an OCT scan showing thinning band of hyperreflective external plant corresponding to attenuation of the RPE and Brooks complex. And you can see deeper hyperreflectivity because of the loss of outer layers, um, including photoreceptors. And this shows hyperreflective clumps again at different levels, segmented plaques of the outer band and elevations with variable hyperreflectivity. In the perilesional area, there are elevations of the outer retinal layers, as well as thickening of the outer hyperreflective band. And at the junction here, you can see um, different degrees of loss. And again, notice here um, that the PIL line um, is uh, lost. So therefore, um, this patient would again have reduced visual acuity from geographic atrophy. And one interesting uh, point to note is um, recently there were changes in OCT that actually preceded the development of um, geographic atrophy, and these have been identified. So these changes include the presence of hyperreflective foci in the retina overlying drusen, a subsidence of the inner nuclear layer and outer plexiform layer with the development of hyperreflective wedge-shaped bands and increased signal transmission below the level of the RP. So these anatomic changes might be used to identify patients early in the course of geographic atrophy development who may still be at a reversible stage and therefore amenable to intervention. So the OCT imaging um, can contribute to a better understanding of the underlying pathologic mechanisms in macular degeneration and um, geographic atrophy. And it may suggest new biomarkers related to disease progression and might potentially indicate new therapeutic targets in macular degeneration. So this hyperreflectivity is a feature um, that you can see here on OCT. And this is a scan of central serous um, courier retinopathy. And this is characterized by a buildup of subretinal fluid um, that you can appreciate here on this scan in the macula caused by abnormalities of the choroidal circulation. And the fluid here leaks from the choroidal circulation and passes through the hyperpermeable areas of the retinal pigment epithelium accumulating in the subretinal space. So on examination, you can see the characteristic finding is a posterior neurosensory retinal detachment caused by a leakage of fluid from the level of the retinal pigment epithelium. And as you can see here again, the OCT um, shows a smooth diffuse elevation of the neurosensory retina which is wider than it's taller. And the RPE will be noted underneath the pocket of the optically blank fluid. And you can notice here that the uh, pigment epithelium detachment is almost always smaller um, with similar height and width. And sometimes the blister that you can see in central serous chorea retinopathy occurs by itself. But sometimes in the middle of the blister, there's a tinier blister of the pigment epithelium um, layer. So you can see this down below here. And this is a PED or pigment epithelial um, detachment, which can sometimes occur in central serous chorea retinopathy. Um, and we talked about how intraretinal um, thickening can be effective can um, show up in many different ocular pathologies. So you can see another slide here of um, intraretinal fluid. And also down below here, um, you can see subretinal fluid. So the next um, diagnosis we'll talk about is juxtapovial macular telangiectasia. And as you can see here, there are significant areas of hyperreflectivity in the central retina due to intraretinal fluid here, which are, as you can see here, cystic in nature. 
And there are also areas of scattered hyper um, reflectivity located in the outer plexiform layer. And so these here are consistent with exudates. So you can see marked by A here, um, which are exudates. And in, you can also notice that um, there is some thinning of the ellipsoid um, zone and the external limiting membrane. And there is also hyperreflectivity, which um, is this B here um, that you notice here. And this is located temporal to the fovea, which is located just deep to the inner nuclear layer. And this is an area of hyperreflectivity that is consistent with um, MACTEL. So this patient was also um, known to have a small choroidal neovascular membrane on OCT angiography. And so this is a paper I came across, um, which I'll give you in references if you want to read this paper. Um, but this patient was a 38-year-old um, female uh, who had res reduced vision in her left eye. Um, and she had, uh, because of the reduced vision, an OCT was done, um, and she was also diagnosed with um, keratoconus. And as you can see here, um, the high quality OCT images were um, captured here, um, but are of poor quality due to her keratoconus. And then they used a, um, a lens here, um, optically, um, so the question was here, optical imperfections of keratoconic corneas impaired the OCT signal um, to levels of diagnostic utility. But what was done is neutralization of anterior irregularity of a keratoconic cornea with the fundal contact lens, and this was sufficient to overcome the keratoconic introduced degradation of the OCT signal. So the second question um, that this um, study has asked was, does keratoconus alter macular anatomy? So they used um, a fundal contact lens to neutralize the effect of the anterior corneal curvature um, for the first part of the study. And they noticed some studies um, show that keratoconic patients have some changes in macular um, thickness. And so um, more studies are needed to see if keratoconus patients have any altered uh, macular anatomy. So this here um, is a slide of lamellar hole. And although the macular um, pseudo hole is fundoscopically similar to a full thickness and a lamellar, lamellar macular hole, a macular pseudo hole has no retinal tissue loss. Often though, there's mild to moderate retinal thickening corresponding to an epiretinal membrane. So remember that a macular pseudo hole will always be um, associated with a perifoveal epiretinal membrane. So you'll need a macular um, scan to differentiate these lesions and any vitreomacular interactions. So how do you distinguish between a full thickness macular hole versus a lamellar hole with irregular foveal contour and defect in the inner fovea? And remember, a pseudo hole has an irregular foveal contour with steep edges without true absence of retinal tissue, which is often associated with an epiretinal membrane. So you can see that there's an inner retinal defect here on the top left-hand slide. And you can also see the foveal contour irregularity here um, in the layers, inner retinal layers here. And the next slide here is a um, full thickness macular hole. Um, and remember, this is in contrast to a lamellar hole uh, with irregular foveal contour and defect in the inner fovea like we saw before or a pseudo hole, which is an irregular foveal contour with steep edges, but remember that the pseudo hole does not have any absence of retinal tissue and is often associated with an epiretinal membrane. So you may have heard of um, this anvil-shaped deformity of the um, full thickness macular hole here. Um, so I looked up, you know, and I have a picture here of an anvil. 
So if you flip this upside down, you can kind of um, see that you know this cystic space here is sort of lifted off. Um, and imagine kind of rotating this um, 360 degrees, and you can see you know um, sort of this upside down anvil um, kind of being lifted off, um, as you see on the picture on your left. So the high resolution image here can allow evaluation of the macula in cross section and um, three dimensionally. And so the OCT can be extremely helpful in detecting subtle macular holes as well as staging obvious macular holes. And OCT can also assist in determining whether there is an associated epiretinal membrane or if the posterior hyloid is still attached or not. And this can be critical in deciding um, their treatment approach. And you can also use OCT to aid in gauging the prognosis of the PELOI. And notice here with um, there's a full thickness defect here, um, but you notice that the RPE or retinal pigment epithelial um, layer here is intact. And you can see um, again on their top left hand side, the RPE is intact, and you can see it as being hyper um, reflective in both of these scans. So the next slide here um, is a picture of retinal neovascularization um, that is showing up here on um, this slide. So you can see the early retinal neovascularization with fibrovascular growth kind of breaking the ILM and extending here into the vitreous. And remember that retinal neovascularization first develops in the intra-retinal layers, but will then extend into the vitreous cavity and disrupt the inner limiting membrane forming fibrovascular proliferations. And you can see here, the OCT when scanned over the retinal neovascularization will reveal hyperreflective lesions that disrupt the ILM and it protrudes into the vitreous cavity connecting to the posterior hyloid membrane if this is present. And on the bottom right hand side here, you see a neovascularization of the disc with this fibrovascular membrane growing over the optic disc here. And this fibrovascular membrane is attaching to the posterior hyloid membrane and blocking the view of the optic disc cup. So this patient here has high risk proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So this here is a slide of outer retinal tubulations in a patient with non-exudative age-related macular degeneration. Um, so outer retinal tubulation is believed to be a rearrangement of the photoreceptors secondary to retinal damage. And it was first discovered by um, OCT scans and confirmed on histopathologic sections. So this condition, the ORT, can be seen in exudative age-related macular degeneration, non-exudative macular degeneration, and other chorioretinal conditions. The ORT can be mistaken as choroidal neovascular membrane on SD OCT. And you can see here um, different shapes of the ORTs here um, on at the bottom right hand corner. Um, so it's highlighted by these um, yellow arrows here. So this here is a slide of plaquenil toxicity. And remember that the OCT can de um, detect early retinopathy and, uh, via RPE and photoreceptor loss in the parafoveal regions that you see here. And you can see this sort of spaceship sign that you see classically with plaquenil um, toxicity. And newer technologies such, such as um, SDOs, OCTs, and autofluorescence even can detect earlier retinopathy um, before visual loss. And you can see here um, these boxes um, represent the damage of these outer retinal layers here. Um, again, with this sort of spaceship sign that you can classically see in plaquenil toxicity. 
And you can see um, outer retinal atrophy here on both of these slides. So we talked about um, central theorist chorea retinopathy. So as you can see here, this is an image of um, central theorist chorea retinopathy as it resolves. And you can see a progressive elongation of the photoreceptor outer segments in acute central theorist chorea retinopathy. So you can see here that when it is acute, you know, there's a neurosensory retinal detachment here. And as it resolves over time, you can see the progressive elongation of the photoreceptor outer segments over the course of CSCR resolution. And this causes an outer segment disruption here. And this is within the dotted lines here on the bottom slide. And this creates this window defect um, that you can see on the slide here down below. And the next slide here for R is um, the radiation retinopathy that we see on this slide. And as you can see on this slide, there's significant retinal swelling. And this is due to the series of cysts located predominantly at the junction of the outer plexiform layer and the outer nuclear layer. And there are significant areas of hyperflectivity located at this junction here. And this here is consistent with exudates. And this patient was also in order to have a microaneurysm. So as you can see, um, this A here represents a um, microaneurysm, uh, despite the fact that you know, they were not known to have um, diabetes. So this patient was known to have been previously treated with um, brachytherapy for ocular melanoma. And so for that reason, she was diagnosed with um, radiation retinopathy. And you can see some hyperflectivity here as well. Um, the IRF, which is intraretinal fluid, and this large um, cystic edema here. So this next slide is a um, picture of a serous retinal detachment. And you can see it can be visualized on an OCT as a smooth, diffuse elevation of the neurosensory retina, which is wider um, than it's taller. And the RPE will be noted underneath the pocket of the optically blank fluid. So you can see the pigment epithelial detachment uh, right adjacent to this um, serous retinal detachment on your left. And remember that the blister um, CSCR can occur by itself, but sometimes like we talked about in the middle of a blister, there's also a tiny blister of pigment epithelial detachment underneath. And you can see on the slide on your left and the um, image on your right uh, that there is indeed a pigment epithelial um, detachment as in this photo. During the first part of their talk, we talked about, um, you know, we saw a slide of a retinal detachment and that was most likely a regimentogenous um, retinal detachment. And here you see a tractional retinal detachment as a physical separation of the neural retina from the retinal pigment epithelium. So this is an important physiological ramification of the creation of a detachment as it increases the physical distance between the photoreceptor cells and their blood supply and the choriocapillaris. And this detachment here um, recreates a space that disappears during early embryonic development. And you can recall that tractional um, retinal detachment involves proliferative membranes on the surface of the retina or the vitreous. And remember that these membranes can pull on the neurosensory retina, causing a physical separation between the neurosensory retina here and the pigment epithelium, um, retinal pigment epithelium. And this is called tractional retinal detachment. It can be seen in proliferative retinopathy due to diabetic disease, sickle cell, and other disease processes leading to um, neovascularization of the retina. 
And fractional retinal detachments can also happen due to proliferative vitreal retinopathy after trauma or surgery. And here you can see a um, focal sort of vitreomacular um, traction here. And down below, um, you can see that focal vitreomacular traction. And you can also see this schesis like intraretinal change here on this slide. And please also appreciate um, the subretinal fluid on the bottom right hand portion of the slide here. So this here um, is a slide of a patient with Usher syndrome and a normal patient on your left. So unfortunately, I could not make the quality of this slide um, come through here, uh, but you'll have to believe me on this one. So um, in the patient on your left, um, there is a normal OCT um, retina here, but in the patient on, on the right with um, this uh, Usher syndrome retinopathy, you can see they only retain a central island of the diminished outer nuclear layer in Usher syndrome. And the abnormal outer nuclear layer and the RP layers are accompanied by severely reduced vision. And another great question I had was um, using the OCT retina um, to look at uveitis. And as you can see, uveitis um, you know, shows different forms of macular edema that you can see here. Uh, and their top one here is cystoid macular edema um, in serpigneous choroidopathy. And on slide B here, um, you can see diffuse macular thickening with cystic changes in chronic uveitis. And on the bottom slide here in C, you can see subretinal fluid in voight carnagie harada disease. Detection and monitoring of uveitic macular edema using OCT has been extensively studied. And so you see three different patterns of fluid distribution in the macula here. So again, um, cystoid macular edema, diffuse macular edema, which is in B, and the serous um, retinal detachment that you see in C. And you can see that the CME here, or um, cystoid macular edema, appears as a low reflective uh, intraretinal spaces that are separated by thin retinal tissue with high reflectivity. And you can see here with the diffuse macular edema in um, B here, you can see small areas of hyperreflectivity and this sort of spongy appearance to some of these um, retinal layers here. And this results in an increased um, macular thickness. And lastly, on the bottom here, you can see the serous retinal detachments are characterized by separation between the neurosensory retina and the RPE. And isolated anterior uveitis can also cause non-cystic retinal thickening uh, that correlates well with disease activity. Epiretinal membrane um, can also be seen in uveitis and appears on OCT, as you saw um, in, in the beginning of the presentation, as this jagged hyperreflective line adhering to the innermost layer of the retina. And the ERM formation is often found in conjunction with vitreal retinal traction, and our tractional mechanism can also contribute to the onset of macular edema that you see here in uveitis. So these slides here um, show vitreomacular traction. So these are examples of vitreomacular traction and a full thickness macular um, hole that you see on um, the C here down below. So what is the difference between the vitreomacular adhesion and vitreomacular traction? So VMA or vitreomacular adhesion was defined as macular attachment of the vitreous cor cortex within a three millimeter radius of the fovea without a change in retinal morphology. And VMT, vitreomacular traction, was differentiated from VMA by the presence of retinal morphological changes, as you can see here in A and B. And then in C, you can see this full thickness um, macular hole defect. 
And this full thickness macular hole defect was defined as a foveal um, lesion involving all of the retinal layers, as you, you can see here, um, compared to A and B. So the next slide here, it's important to distinguish um, between a full thickness macular hole um, versus a lamellar hole versus a pseudo hole, which we talked about. And this is Watsky allen sign is um, commonly used in clinical practice um, to have a patient look at a line on your slit beam and to say whether, you know, whether it's broken or not. Um, and you can see, you know, there's a, a macular hole here. The patient's point of view um, will be this, where they see a break um, in this line here. So the next slide here for X is X-linked retinoschisis. And this is an inherited retinal disorder, uh, which causes early vision loss in males. And you can see on um, a frontoscopic exam, um, a patient will have a foveal schesis. And you can see this as a spoke-like pattern here radiating from the fovea and with their dome-like elevation of the um, thin layer of the retina here. And schesis is most often in the macula, but it can also extend to the periphery and it occurs in more than half of the patient. And these bullous retinoschesis um, may improve over time. So again, this is an um, OCT macula of a patient with an X-linked retinoschisis. And you can see this large um, inner retinal uh, layer edema. And I also had um, seen some questions about um, macular dystrophies here. So I have um, here a best disease uh, patient on the right and Stargardt's dystrophy here um, on excuse me, best disease on your left and a Stargardt patient on your right. So in early stages of best disease, um, our typical lesion has an egg yolk appearance. So hence the name vitelliform. And this is later replaced here, as you can see, with atrophy and scarring, as you see here. So notice that, you know, this patient's um, right eye here had more advanced disease than her left, and you can see this on her OCT. So notice in her right eye, there's a loss of the outer retinal layers um, that you can see with this yellow arrow here, and pigment epithelium, which corresponds, um, you know, when you do an FAF, you can see this hypofluorescent area here. And in her left eye, you can see the splitting of the retinal layers. And you can also see uh, this area of subretinal fluid um, with this blue arrow here on this slide here. Her initial visual acuity here was 2020 in the right eye and 2030 in her left eye. And notice her that her visual acuity is not severely um, affected because the lesions were eccentric to the fovea. So on your right hand side is a um, picture of Stargardt's disease. And you can see that the inner segment, outer segment junction, the photoreceptors, the outer nuclear layer, and the retinal pigment epithelium are lost in the center of macula of both of our eyes. And remember, Stargardt's disease is the most common inherited single gene retinal disease and it usually has an autosomal recessive inheritance. So next we'll review the answers um, to the quiz questions. So this I believe um, most of you had gotten. So this is um, a slide of central serous chorea retinopathy. And you can see it is characterized by a buildup of subretinal fluid in the macula, and it's caused by abnormalities in the choroidal circulation. So this fluid here um, leaks from the choroidal circulation and passes through the hyperpermeable areas of the RPE layer, and it accumulates here in the subretinal space. So again, on examination, you can see um, a characteristic finding is a posterior neurosensory retinal detachment caused by leakage of fluid from the level of the RPE. 
And you can see a serous retinal detachment is visualized with an OCT as a smooth, diffuse elevation of the neurosensory retina, which is wider um, here, as you notice in both of these slides, than it's taller. And please also recall that in some cases of CRCR, you can also see a pigment epithelial um, detachment that is noted underneath the pocket of this optically blank fluid. And recall that the PED here is almost always smaller with a similar um, height and weight as the larger um, piece here. So the diagnosis um, for this slide was vitreal hemorrhage and retinal traction. So here you can see that the posterior vitreous is detached from the underlying retina here. On the posterior side of the vitreous are significant fibrotic membranes. And these membranes are associated with significant retinal traction. And there's an elevation of the retina um, here due to the traction. And this here is causing um, the intraretinal cysts. And there is also evidence of a previous laser photocoagulation as there is some outer retinal thinning and a reverse shadow uh, that there is geographic atrophy. So this is uh, evidenced by this A here. So it um, points to the A on this slide. And so therefore, this patient was diagnosed with a recurrent vitreous hemorrhage um, and traction here that you can see. So the answer to that question here um, was B, vitreal hemorrhage and retinal traction. So the answer to this slide um, was C, acute middle maculopathy. And here you notice um, there is a segmental swelling of the middle retina here. Um, and this actually is a newly identified condition on OCT. So it is related to the schema of the super, superficial uh, capillary plexus. So on OCT here, um, the nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell layer are within normal limits, as you can see. And there is middle um, retinal hyperreflectivity that you can see here. Specifically, the inner plexiform layer, IPL, and the outer plexiform layer are hyperreflective due to the swelling. So the inner nuclear layer is somewhat obscured due to the swelling of their two plexiform layers that you can see here. And this is showing up as almost this train track appearance on this scan. So the swelling of these uh, layers is causing that shadowing of the outer um, nuclear layer that you see. So therefore, this patient was diagnosed with acute middle maculopathy and this is a type of acute macular um, neuroretinopathy. And these rare lesions are believed to be related to a segmental ischemia of the superficial capillary plexus. And this patient was also diagnosed with a stroke, which caused temporary um, paralysis. So remember, there are up to four retinal vascular um, networks in the macula. So the superficial vascular plexus, SVP, is supplied by the central retinal artery and composed of larger arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins. And there are two deeper capillary networks above and below the INL or inner nuclear layer. And these are referred to the intermediate and deep capillary plexes or ICP and DCP. And these are supplied by the vertical anastomosis of the SVP. And the fourth network here is a regional layer called the radial um, peripapillary capillary plexus. So again, this patient um, had a segmental ischemia here due to the superficial capillary plexus. So the diagnosis um, for this slide was sclerochoroidal calcification. So you can see here, there's a um, white lesion just outside of the vascular um, arcade. And so what is this? So while the retinal tissue is still normal to the, your left and to your right, 
this lesion here is in order to be elevated as opposed to a depression or absence of tissue, uh, which can also present as a depigmented lesion. So the retinal tissue overlying the lesion is normal with the exception of some compression of the outer nuclear layer. So the ELM or external limiting membrane and underlying ellipsoid are visible in the area here to your right. There is an elevation of the RPE from the underlying Brooks membrane. And this is um, shown by A, showing the Brooks membrane. And the hyperreflective area in the retina is normal and is related um, to the retinal blood vessel that has been sectioned here. So this lesion itself is located at the level of the sclera, and it is hyperreflective here. So therefore, um, this patient was diagnosed with sclerochoroidal calcification. And you saw this slide um, in the beginning of the presentation. So we'll go over briefly um, what the diagnoses are. So again, on um, 1A, you can see um, intraretinal edema here. Um, so this is a slide of um, diabetic macular edema. And here in 1B, you can see a macula of retinal detachment, which exhibits um, extensive subretinal fluid here. On 1C, you can see an AMD patient with some small subretinal um, fluid here with this photoreceptor loss. And on 1D, you can see this um, pigment epithelial uh, detachment here with adjacent intraretinal exudates, which remember causes um, some hyperreflectivity on OCT retina. Here on figure 1E, you can see a CSCR with this focal um, PED right beneath it. And in figure 1F, you can see these multifocal large PEDs. And this is a patient with um, polyploidal choroidal vasculopathy, which is a disease of choroidal vasculature. And this is characterized by um, serosanguinous detachments of the pigment epithelium, and you can also see exudative changes that can commonly lead to subretinal fibrosis. So clinical pearls from today um, were to understand you know, OCD's capabilities in clinical practice. You can learn to meaningfully interpret various lines, layers, and contours in normal eyes, so you can then um, learn how to interpret OCD in retinal pathology. And then you can transition to variations in different retinal, choroidal, and vitreal abnormalities. And remember that, that the PIL line, the photoreceptor integrity line, um, gives you an estimate of the visual acuity based on its appearance right beneath the phobia. And I'm happy to send you um, a list of references if you need um, to review the papers I um, alluded to in this presentation. And thank you so much for your time. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So with regards to um, glaucoma diagnosis, um, so here I was covering the OCT retina, so I'm happy to address um, you know, um, glaucoma diagnosis using the retinal nerve fiber layer um, in a different presentation. Um, so Stargardt's disease, uh, we had a slide on um, Stargardt's. Uh, so here you can see uh, on the right-hand side of your slide, um, Stargardt's disease. And um, in Stargardt's, notice that you know, there are atrophic macular lesions. So notice how the inner segment, um, outer segment junction um, has been disrupted here on these um, slides on your right. And the retinal pigment epithelium is also lost um, in the center of the macula in both, of, um, both eyes here. So right eye on top, um, left eye on the bottom here. 
And I uh, see a lot of questions about OCT and glaucoma, um, which are again out of the scope for this um, presentation, but I'm happy to address um, in the future. And um, in terms of you know uh, getting good OCT images of um, highly myopic patients, remember we talked about um, how they used to fund us um, contact lenses for a keratoconic patient. So perhaps you know um, more studies are needed to see if you know there's um, you know we can get good images in highly myopic patients um, as well for OCT. And with regards to reading sort of OCT um, step by step, so I'm going to go back to the um, slide of a normal OCT scan here. And um, remember that it's really important to you know, know a normal uh, OCT retina here. And so with this um, you know, normal OCT retina, um, you can know all the layers, um, you know, sort of these uh, layers here on the retina. And then you can then compare the um, you know, pathological OCT retina slides to these layers to see which layers are disrupted. So we went over a lot of um, you know, features you can see on OCT, um, as well as some diagnos diagnosis where you saw um, edema, exudates. And so it's important to see which layer um, of the retina the pathology is happening in um, to make that diagnosis. You can use the age of the patient medical history, um, medications, um, to kind of read an OCT um, and come up with a diagnosis. And chronic CSCR on OCT is also an excellent question. So, so remember that um, this is a picture of an acute um, Core, uh, CSCR. And when you have um, chronic CSCR, what happens is um, you can see sort of uh, as the acute CSCR resolves, you can see the outer segment um, disruption here that is within these dotted lines. And so this creates a window defect um, once the edema from the acute CSCR resolves over time. Thank you all for joining me today, and I'm happy to address any other questions um, when it's been posted on Orbis. Great, thank you, Dr. Sravina. Thank you so much for having me.